Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jay Inslee, Governor of the State of Washington. I'm so delighted to be here to talk about something that is so close to my heart, which is this uh, monster of climate change. Can we have a shout out for CAP, for their leadership, for what they've done, and John Podesta and his team. They've been great. Well, look, this we know. This we know. We are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, and we are the last generation who can do something about it. And I am here to tell you we are going to do something about it. We are going to defeat climate change. We are going to make sure Donald Trump's administration is a blip in history. And we are going to make sure America rejoins our leadership position in the world. And in my brief comments today, I want to tell you why I believe that. First reason is we know what's at stake. Look, I wrote a co-authored a book on clean energy a few years ago. I've been working on this for 15 years, and there's a reason for that. The reason is I do not want to climate change to cloud the future of my three grandkids. I want my three grandkids to be able to fish for salmon just like their grandmother did and ski in the, in the, in the snow just like their uncle does. Our grandkids are at stake and nobody comes into my state and fools with my grandkids without a fight. And they're going to get a fight on climate change and we're doing it. Second, the reason we are going to succeed is that this is a matter of character as much as a matter of science. It is an issue about the basic fundamental character of the American people. And I know something about the American people. We are optimists. We are a can-do people. We do not take no in the face of technological challenges. And our enemies, the climate deniers, are pessimists. They are afraid we can't solve this problem. Well, I got a word from Americans are optimists. We're can-do people. We are going to get this job done because it is a matter of character. Third is a matter of jobs. There is no better jobs message in the United States than clean energy today. In every community across this nation, clean energy jobs are growing twice as fast as the rest of the economy. And solar energy, 17 times as fast as the rest of the economy. And it is not just urban areas. You want to talk about jobs and the Midwest and rural areas, our jobs are in the rural areas. The largest manufacturer of electric car carbon fiber is in a small town in eastern Washington. The largest manufacturer of polysilicate is for solar energy, for solar panels, is in a small town in eastern Washington. This is a jobs message. And if we want to win the Midwest, I can say this. When it comes to clean energy, the Midwest is the best because they got great people who know how to build things. And so we're going to make sure that they do. Third reason, we just understand that this is now going to become a central tenet of our message to the American people. Climate change will no longer be on the back burner. It will not be a peripheral issue. It is a central message. Every Democrat running anywhere in America needs to make it a central message because the American people are with us. They have watched the hurricanes. They have seen the forest fires. They know that last year, the average family of four spent $4,000 paying for the damage. That's why 80% of the people believe we should stay in the Paris Agreement. And here's the good news. As soon as uh, uh, Trump wanted to pull out of the Paris Agreement within 48 hours, we'd stood up a thing called the United States Climate Alliance. It's 15 states. It's governors who are leading. And here's a central message. Donald Trump cannot stop us in states and governors in building a clean energy future. He cannot stop us in our renewable portfolio standard. He cannot stop us in our efficiency standards. He cannot stop us in helping people get electric cars. And that's why I'm so proud of my fellow uh, Democratic governors, Ramondo, who's got the first offshore wind in Rhode Island, and Murphy, who's got us back within the first week in the Reggie program, putting a cost on carbon. We are moving the needle. The people are with us. So we are going to win this battle. It is based on who we are, and it is based on justice. I remember meeting this young woman named Jasmine, a young Hispanic woman aged 14. She lives in the industrial sector of South Seattle. She's breathing those toxic fumes all the time. She told me she was 11 years of age before she understood that there were some kids who didn't get asthma. And she went out and studied the asthma rates. And guess what? They're directly correlated to carbon emission in the particulates is involved. So we're going to win this battle for many reasons. And I come to you as a, 
a person with optimism and confidence, in part because we have blown up the myth that you can't have a clean environment. You know, the number one economy in the United States is Washington State with some of the best climate fighting policies. I'm proud of that. So we're going to win this because we have the character of optimism. We're going to win this because we have a job creation message that is unparalleled. We're going to win this because we have an understanding of basic justice. And our grandkids is something we never give up. This is our destiny. We will do this. We must do it. And I'll look forward to the victory party. Thanks a lot. Joining Governor Inslee on stage, please welcome Mustafa Ali, Tom Steyer, and moderator Amy Harder. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is great to be here. Um, my name is Amy Harder. I cover energy and climate change at Axios. Uh, if you're not signed up for our, our energy newsletter, I encourage you to do so. I have a weekly column there where I cover a lot of these issues that we're about to dive in today. And it's really great to, to see uh, Governor Inslee and, and Tom again. I think the last time I spoke with both of you was on the sidelines of the United Nations climate talks in, in Bonn, Germany. I hope you'll be in Poland. I already have my accommodations, so I, I hope I'll be able to see you there. And Mustafa, it's great to see you as well. Um, I just I caught your Samantha B performance, so so congrats. I encourage everybody to watch it. It was it was funny. Um, but before I dive in for a question for the um, for you three, I want to ask everybody here in this room a question. Um, raise your hand if you know somebody who doesn't acknowledge that climate change is real. I see uh, relatively few hands go up. Um, I have my, my crazy aunt, she doesn't acknowledge it, um, so I, I certainly put my hand up. Uh, not to be the skunk in the room, but of course, you know, the, 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 the dynamic here in Washington is, is very different than in, in Washington State, which of course is my home state, so it's great to be sitting here with you, Governor, um, and in California. So, so acknowledging the, the, the change of dynamics here in Washington and the fact that President Trump doesn't acknowledge it. The Republican Party continues, the Congressional uh, Republican Party continues to not acknowledge it publicly, although they continue to say privately that they, they do. It raises a question to me, which is, do you really need to acknowledge climate change as a big problem in order to solve it? Um, or are there ways around that? I mean, you mentioned, Governor, that you don't think it is going to be on the back burner anymore. But can progress still get done, even if it is? Um, and I guess, Governor, I'll just I'll, I'll let you start with that with that question. Uh, first off, I really appreciate being on your guys' panel with you. Thank you very much <laughs> for letting us join you. you get, you're doing such great work. Couple thoughts. Uh, number one, w we can win this battle talking again about the American character rather than the principles of physics, because the vast majority of, of, of Americans understand intrinsically we ought to be a leader in the world, and that's why 80% of the people believe we should be in the Paris Agreement. The vast majority of Americans understand that when you move technology forward, we create jobs. They fundamentally understand that. We get it in my state. Look, we invented the first jet airplane. We invented the best software. We even invented the $4 cup of coffee. So uh, <laughs> they get that fundamental characteristic. And they respond to a message of optimism rather than pessimism. So what I'm saying is, is that we have these uniting principles, and when we talk to people on those, you don't have to get hung up in physics. But you also have to realize there will be someone, some people who are so ideologically opposed to government doing anything, they're never going to agree with you. And we've got to realize that. But we're going to win this anyway with the vast majority in the middle. And we are doing it. Look, the polling is moving. It's moved 8% in the last two years of people believe we ought to deal with this issue. It's moving very dramatically because they're seeing it on their TV screens when the forest fires are being devastated and the mudslides are coming down uh, from people and Oprah's house is now getting surrounded. So this is an issue we're winning on and I'm confident about it. Tom, do you have any thoughts about, I mean, you're very passionate about this issue, but also a lot of other issues. Of course, you're running a little campaign called um, uh, to impeach Trump, but we're, of course, we're here to talk about climate. You started your next gen climate was on climate and now you've broadened it. Um, was that a tacit acknowledgement that you can't run on climate alone? Well, I think that what Jay has had to say is absolutely true. 
down the line. And I think that the argument about climate is, I don't think we really are hearing this argument going on anywhere. I, I don't hear Republicans actually standing up on any kind of objective basis and arguing about climate. And I think that the numbers are moving for everybody in the United States to move to our position uh, and agreeing with us increasingly because there's really no debate left. On the other hand, we're not winning in Washington, D.C. on climate because the EPA and the Department of Energy are moving exactly against us. And I think that reflects something that I've come to believe about a theory of change on this issue and on other issues, which is I think objectively we've won this argument. And that doesn't, and in the states where, as Jay said, we have Democratic governors, then in fact we have leadership, we have results, we have outcomes that are really good, and in fact, on any kind of business economic argument, we have all the facts on our case now in addition to the scientific facts. But I've come to a belief that in order for us to win in a large way on climate, that it actually is going to be as a result of a coalition of progressives pulling together on a number of issues together and winning elections so that people like Jay Inslee get elected and the results follow from that. So whereas before I would have said in the United States of America, if we can prove it's the smartest thing economically, if we can prove it's the smartest thing from a health standpoint, if we can prove this increases our leadership around the world and makes us a better country and a country we are safer and happier to pass on to our kids and grandkids, then we win. That's not true. So I would say in order for us to win on this, we have to in fact win elections as a result of a coalition of people who have each other's backs on every single issue Jay does do that. Washington is proof that it works. And I think that's the only way we're going to have it work in Washington, D.C. and the United States writ large. Mustafa, I want to go to you. You spent almost uh, 25 years at the EPA and you resigned last year. Can you talk about, you know, you work a lot on environmental justice issues, which, um, as we were talking before, deals with climate change, but it's a lot, it's a lot more than that. Can, can you talk about when you talk to people on the ground outside of this Washington bubble, you know, are they really concerned about climate change or are they more concerned about clean water and clean air, which of course is related to climate change? Yeah, so the communities that I've worked with, and I've worked in over a thousand communities, we take a holistic approach to these issues, and it's an excellent opportunity also for the intersection of climate change. So we talk about housing justice, transportation justice, we talk about economic justice, of course we're also talking about the impacts that are happening uh, inside and because of uh, climate change as well. So when you're having these conversations with everyday folks out on the ground, they want to know, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, asthma impacts, and we know 25 million people, 7 million kids, and disproportionately it's African American Latino communities that are being impacted from this. Then we have the conversation about where are those fossil fuel facilities located in those frontline communities. So there is a direct connection. I often talk about a double whammy that goes on inside of communities. The first one is communities like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas. Uh, they're on the ship channel um, where these fossil fuel facilities have been for decades now and people feel like they're actually breathing in gasoline fumes and then the floods and storms that come from the impacts from climate change. So people get it. Um, of why we need to make that change happen. Now, it's not so much the folks in the communities that don't get it, it's the question of the policymakers uh, and those who are supporting organizations, do they get where we need to make the investment so that we can actually win on these issues um, is where people are. So for them, it's about everyday things that are impacting their communities. And it's also about the opportunities that exist when we talk about moving toward renewables, when we talk about uh, solar and wind. Are we also being inclusive of the folks who are often the ones who are being forgotten? Will we have folks who are African-American, Latino, and others having opportunities to own their own businesses in this space so that we can lower the impacts that are happening? Will senior leadership inside of these organizations and middle management positions be affordable to these folks? So for us who work on environmental justice issues, it is a holistic part, and climate change is one of those uh, components that we know we have to win on because our communities are the ones that are hit first and worst. Uh, a quick house uh, housekeeping note, please remember to join the conversation online. The hashtag is Cap Ideas. so if anybody says anything that you think is Twitter worthy, please, please tweet away. Um, I want to go back to, to Washington State for a moment. Uh, Tom mentioned, you know, the success of the coalition 
in Washington on these issues. When it comes to the carbon tax, though, I think many of us saw that w even within a Democrat-controlled legislature that there wasn't enough votes to pass the carbon tax this year. And, um, you know, there was an effort that also didn't succeed a couple of years ago. And many people see Washington's efforts in this area as sort of a test case for a national carbon tax. Um, you, you said at the time, Governor, quote, um, the arc of history, on the arc of history, we're not quite there. We're not quite far along enough. Um, that day will come, but we're not quite there yet. What's taking so long, I guess, is my first question. And then my second question is there's um, going to be, um, as many of us know, a ballot initiative, probably, if, if they get the votes. Um, do you support that effort? And, and what, would, what are you planning to do to sort of support it, if indeed you do? Uh, yes, I wholeheartedly support it. This will create the first direct carbon fee in the United States that will create a, a billion dollar fund plus to help create the clean energy jobs we're talking about, to deal with the economic injustice of pollution and help these communities of color get access to training funds and help with their energy costs, to help people get access to electric cars and solar energy. And uh, uh, the, the reason it hasn't happened yet is not November. Now this November, we're gonna have people coming out in droves to vote because they have been inspired because they have seen the chaos when you have a climate denier in the White House and they've had a belly full of it and they're gonna come vote and they're gonna have an opportunity to vote for an initiative with the biggest alliance and Tom is so right on this issue. We have, I think, one of the most beautiful alliances I've ever seen, at least in my state, between the labor community who understands the jobs perspective, the communities of color and poverty who understand that they have been on the short end of the stick for too long, for the traditional environmental community, and, and folks in politics as well. So I am very uh, bullish on this prospect and excited about it. And I'm undeterred because I think if you look at the arc of history, you know, Nelson Mandela didn't win for 22 years, then he became president. And uh, it took us a long time to get Medicare. But this is the nature of progress, but we're going to win it. And I look forward to all of you vacationing in November in the state of Washington <laughs> and a few moments helping make sure that this happens. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Mustafa, you know, there is some criticism uh, that a carbon tax is regressive, um, often impacting, you know, poorer people worse and oftentimes tends to be also people of color. Do you personally, what's your position on a carbon tax and are you going to be visiting Washington in November? <laughs> I was just in Washington not that long ago. <laughs> well, part of Washington, because I come from the red side, Spokane, Washington. Yeah, I was over that direction, yes, <laughs> yes, but I, I'm willing to come wherever, um, you know, especially if it's free. So... <laughs> Um, in relationship to a carbon tax, what I think that we really have to pay attention to, and you kind of raised this, is that we in the environmental justice movement concern ourselves with the fact of hot spots being created. So we are always trying to make sure that whatever policy is moving forward, that things will not be pushed into our communities and then we have a greater burden that's going on. So I'm, I would not speak for the environmental justice movement. Communities speak for themselves um, and there are different views, um, whether we're talking about a carbon tax or some of the other mechanisms and tools that are being put in place uh, to be able to address some of these issues. So each community will make the decision for themselves about what may work best in their space. What's, what's your personal opinion on a carbon tax? Um, I think it would depend on how it's structured. Um, so I think that in California, folks have been doing some very innovative work um, with some of the various bills that are out there because uh, in some instances, resources that are coming are moving back to communities and communities are then able to utilize them in the way that they see fit to make change happen. Um, so for me, I, I don't make broad statements. I would need to see exactly what it looks like and what the structure would be for resources and where those resources would go. Would the voice of communities help to drive that process? Uh, and then how we utilize those to actually revitalize those communities. Tom. Can I add something to this? Mm -hmm. In response to this, I think you're gonna be happier about our initiative when we have a chance to talk about it because we have been very adept at driving investments to these communities so we don't get this hot spot. Phenomena. We, we're going to do exactly the opposite in the investment portfolio in the initiative, number one. Number two, we are recycling these dollars to help low-income people with their energy costs. So they're going to be net probably on the positive side on this. This has been very important 
Because frankly, our movement, and Tom was so right on this, can't be just kind of the environmental movement. This has to be the broader community, and we're inspired. I just met these Parkland students out here. You know, they're gonna help us, help us pass the gun initiative too, so this is one big happy family. Tom, are you gonna be spending some time and money up in Washington? <laughs> that remains to be seen. But I would say this. First of all, I think Mustafa and Jay are exactly right, that in this, God is in the details. And if you look at what happened in California last year, we reauthorized our cap and trade. And that happened at the end of August. But on January 2nd, we went up to Sacramento and said, if this bill is gonna get reauthorized, which was critical for our state, it is gonna to have to be coupled with another bill that specifically deals with environmental justice, that specifically deals with both the issue about the imposition of bad air and asthma onto poor communities and communities of color. And it specifically has to deal with where the money from the tax, from the cap and trade program goes. And from the very beginning, there was no chance that the cap and trade bill would get reauthorized without a huge environmental justice accompanying bill. It couldn't have passed. And in fact, the people who really led it were two Latino legislators from some of the poorest districts in the state of California. So as everybody looks at California and thinks, oh, those guys can pass any kind of progressive energy legislation you know, at the drop of a hat, it was extremely difficult to pass. Governor Brown did do a fantastic job of marshalling everybody, but the environmental justice aspect of it was critical, central, we started from it. And if you cannot go and put that as the add-on, it really has to lead. I now have a couple of uh, lightning round questions. I'm going to say, I'm going to, so I, I know this is near impossible in Washington, but keep your answers to one word or two word phrases, nothing longer if, if humanly possible. Um, I'm gonna say a word and then tell me what the first thing is that pops into your mind, the first word that pops into your mind. Uh, Scott Pruitt. Anybody can go first. Corrupt. Deplorable. Gone. Uh, he is an optimist. <laughs> uh, nuclear power. Unfulfilled promise. Old. A possibility in discrete new technology. That's as succinct as, as any politician can be. Thank you, Governor. <laughs> um, it was, it was. I'm not being sarcastic. Uh, California, speaking of the Golden State, California's just approved solar mandate. To, I'm sure you all know this, and I'm sure many of you do as well, but of course, California's Energy Commission just approved every new home, most new homes have to have solar panels on the rooftops. <laughs> See the audience's thoughts. Um, you know, there's, there has been some disagreement among sort of the energy nerds in, in, this, in this country about whether or not that's the best policy. Um, but anyway, so the first word that pops into your head. Necessary revolution. Equity needed. Uh, Washington figures out for, a way for everybody to have that and pays for it. <laughs> Tom, do you have solar panels on your house in California? Yeah, we do. But, I mean, one of the big issues in terms of solar and, and, and why this is, is how is going to be to answer Mustafa's question. What do you do for communities I remember the first time I talked to Kevin DeLeon about this and we were talking about clean energy and he was like, Tom, if you put solar panels on the houses in my district, the houses will fall down. We're interested in clean air and jobs. So there's a real question for in a lot of communities, how are you, they going to be able to band together to in effect do community solar? How are we going to make this equitable and just? And his point about clean air and jobs is absolutely critical, but if we're gonna talk about costs and the spreading of technology, then we've gotta take that into consideration from day one. Governor, would you ever try to push some, that similar policy in Washington State? You know, I, I wouldn't say never, but I do believe right now in the, in the revolution that's happening in my state, uh, what we're doing right now is developing a billion dollar fund so we can help people get those solar panels and we can avoid the fear of those who are afraid of the housing costs going up when we've got a, an epidemic of homelessness already because we have such a great economy. So I think you've, you've got to have something, again, that where the community moves forward together 
And we ought to do that where people at the lower end of the income scale move forward together, meaning help them get a way to finance that solar package. And that's why having this, uh, actually it's a carbon fee rather than a tax, mm -hmm. but it's a way to help them do that so we don't get into this schism between the haves and haves nots in an economy that is already unequal. So I believe the clean energy revolution, the climate change fight has to be fought in parallel with the fight for a more equal economy. And both of those have to be victorious at the same time. We got a good plan to do that. One of the big ways um, that the climate movement has, has, has shifted their focus in particular over the last couple of years have been lawsuits um, suing oil companies for alleging um, their role in causing climate change. Um, King County became the first um, entity in Washington State. California has been at the forefront of it. Do you all, do you think this is a well spent time of the movement? And, and do you think if Democrats regain control of the House and possibly the Senate that Congress should also hold hearings on this topic? Look, I think there's a long established tradition in America that you're supposed to be responsible for the outcomes of your actions, particularly when you know what those outcomes are. So if you look at what happened with cigarette companies, for a long time they maybe didn't know what was going on, but after a while the science became unavoidable about what the impact was of smoking cigarettes. And ultimately, when they acted contrary to that and didn't tell the truth about it over decades, they were liable. I think that what's going on in climate change, which I think we all said at the outcome is at the outset is this is not a scientific debate anymore. The outcomes are clear. It, and so are you supposed to be re responsible in American society for extreme outcomes that you're causing other people as a result of you making profits? I think that our legal system says yes. Well, we um, are almost out of time. In fact, we are out of time. Um, Governor Mustafa, do you have any final comments? comments you want to share um, about going forward and, and what Democrats should focus on going into the midterms and the next presidential? Well, coming from Appalachia, I think it's extremely important that we focus on revitalizing vulnerable communities, uplifting uh, those success stories that are out there of communities like the Spartanburg community, uh, excuse me, Spartanburg, South Carolina, the Regenesis community um, that took the $20,000 grant and leveraged it to $300 million in changes. And climate change is a part of that because they're putting a 35-acre solar farm in. So for me, these conversations, if you want them to resonate with folks, then there has to be how we are lowering the public health impacts, but also how we are creating economic opportunities for those who have often been forgotten. And that is a message that will resonate with folks that sometimes, for whatever reason, we seem to forget. Great. I just want to thank you for everybody's leadership in this room. I hope that in every instance where you feel frustration and anxiety and anger about the dark uh, spot in, in coming out of the White House, that you will find a way to channel that into the most effective thing you can do to right this ship. And frankly, it's to elect a governor somewhere that you can reach to develop these clean energy policies that Donald Trump cannot stop who will also stop the gerrymandering that has been so pernicious, which has prevented us from having a House of Representatives. I hope you will help. Thank you. Okay. Well, I want to thank our panelists. I think we just skimmed the, the, top of, the tip of the iceberg, no pun intended, of this topic. And so I want to thank you very much.